Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 280 of Real Blend, a podcast that only needs 12 more Emmy nominations to catch up to Jake Hamilton. My name is Sean O'Connell, and on this week's show, Robert Rodriguez, the great Robert Rodriguez, returns to the show. We're going to be discussing his latest films and a few other things from his career, and... We're bringing back a really fun game, something that we like to play called the Oscars in review. So stay tuned. We'll discuss that later on. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Sean O'Connell, the managing editor at Cinema Blend and co-host of the Real Blend podcast alongside 12 time Emmy nominated entertainment reporter Kevin McCarthy. Hey, Kevin, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Jake Hamilton real. of Fox yeah. 32 in Chicago. Hi, Jakey. Hi, buddy. How are you? Congratulations, sir, on your you, latest man. Emmy nomination. I appreciate Jake, you. For the people who haven't, um, well, you wouldn't have heard yet, I don't assume, uh, received an Emmy nomination for a terrific package that he did uh, about a guy who collects used on set movie props and collects is is uh, even soft peddling it because this guy yeah. is curates is uh, a closer uh, word that's thank yeah, you yeah. very much Gabe yeah. yes terrific uh, so uh, Jakey where can people find this video yeah it's on YouTube if you uh, you know go into my sort of video collection uh, on, send on it, YouTube send it to me I'll add a little bug Jake for Beautiful. people to yeah. look above Jake's yeah. head it's a it's, it's a pretty wild <laughs> collection of stuff. It's uh, yeah, it's up there. It's up there. Uh, it's it's underground, secretly outside uh, the city limits of Chicago, and in sort of an underground bunker. Um, even the door itself to get in is a a movie prop, and he has everything from you know uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe to uh, Ghostbusters, Lord of the Rings. Uh, you know, just you know some of the most iconic props in movie history. He has. Uh, collected over the years and he was kind enough to to crack open those collectible doors for us and not to dive too deep into into his thing or even blow up his spot but did he explain to you like how he got all these things because he has stolen, amazing stolen. amazing things <laughs> well it starts yeah yeah stalin it's it's the the, the best oceans 11 spinoff ever uh it, it starts it, based on what i read a lot about these guys that do this it's a very small tight-knit community of guys who are supportive of each other but also very very competitive right. um and it seems like it's very uh snowball you know you start with one little thing and trade it for two little things and then you get the two little things you trade it for four little things and you kind of start building up and building up and building up um he was uh very apprehensive to talk about uh the finances of this yeah. Yeah, yeah, um yeah. you know one of his most prized possessions uh was deckard's pkd his blaster from uh, blade runner uh which just this i mean we're talking about one gun on a wall of massive guns and yeah. that gun itself was i think two hundred seventy five thousand dollars <laughs> so you know you kind of yeah, but it's wow. so funny how you know he, he's a completionist and his most prized possession that he wanted was owned by his best friend who won't give it to him and so he has all of uh harrison ford's suit from Blade Runner, but he wants the overcoat and you don't okay. realize how much you need to see the overcoat to Cause I looked at the suit and I was like, I don't recognize that. And he's like, it's Harrison Ford's suit from Blade Runner. I was like, Oh, that's, that's oh my God. That's awesome. And he goes, yeah, but like you need the coat you yeah, have yeah. to have, because in most shots he's wearing the big overcoat and his best it friend must keep has him it. Up at night. Oh, it drives him Not nuts. Drives him nuts. <laughs> uh, Appreciate you, $275,000 is what I call Kevin McCarthy money. Uh, yeah. It's so, what we pay him to do real blend. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Kev. This is Kev McCarthy of Fox 5 in Washington, D.C. Hello, my friend. How are you? Well, no, no, you you, you introduced me wrong. You got to say zero time Emmy nominated <laughs> Kevin McCarthy. Um, because I'm so proud. I'm so proud of that number. Uh, no, no, no. It's Which means see, uh, you've never yeah. lost, sir. True. true. Jake, how many Emmys have you lost? I've lost eight. Oh, so, God. Yeah, I've lost eight, one, three. So and then, failure. And then, in yeah. A, yeah, in a way, Kevin's ahead. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm all, it's almost like John Williams, where it's just sort of like, yeah, like... You know what? What eight eight Oscars are great, but you've been nominated fifty two times. So. Sean, yeah. Sean, some of uh, some of our listeners watch the show on their TV. Can we can we be nominated now? How does that work? 
We watch I don't on the know. TV. Yeah. Like a Webby? Is... Can we get like a Webby? <laughs> uh, we so, could. We could win Webby. Yeah. It feels like something that we should be eligible for. So we can get one of John Williams' nominations or something. Yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. Come on, his, his hand went over, man. Even even the ones I, you I, lost. Just, we'll just take, send we'll us one of your it. Oscars. Just send yeah, us yeah, one yeah. of your Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hans Zimmer said we're basically best friends. Like, can't he get us yeah. a, an in at the Academy for God's sakes? Uh, that is uh, true. That is true. We 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 have been in his studio. Kind of. Technically. Technically. Yes. Technically right. speaking. Go find the Hans Zimmer interview. It's one of the best ones that we've ever done. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, hello. Thank you very much for joining us. Head down, give us a like and a subscribe. Um, it is hat day for Kevin and Gabe, obviously, Damn it. today. Kev got a new Foo Fighters hat. How is that show? Oh, dude, oh, I love that dude. hat. I just realized that. Yeah, my well, my brother and I, yeah, so I, I was just, uh, we were recording this on Wednesday. I went down to Virginia Beach last night and saw the Foo Fighters with my brother, uh, we were in the pit and it was like, you know, right there. It was just unbelievable. And not to get like too into the weeds, but for people who don't know, I mean, Dave Grohl is from the D.C. Oh, area. Yeah, Vir- that's right. That's right. Virginia. Yeah. yeah. So even even though we were in Virginia Beach, it felt like a very personable show. You could just feel the you know that he was, you know, I, I was watching this guy on stage. I think Foo Fighters have been together for tw- what 28 years now. Then you have his Nirvana projects prior. And I'm watching this guy on stage. and I'm just like. This guy is a genuine rock star, like loves every minute of it, is fully, completely there with the audience. It was they played for two hours and 35 minutes. Dude, you remember when he toured with a cast on his leg? Yes, I was. I I saw that tour. I saw that. Yeah, Yeah. I saw him in Wrigley. And he was in like a Game of Thrones kind of. I mean, anyone else gets injured and they're like, you know, (laughs) I'll catch you guys on the flip side. Dave Grohl's like, put me in a throne. Yeah. And the drummer they had last night, uh, obviously, for people who don't know, with Taylor Hawkins, their 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 drummer who passed away. Um, Jake and I actually interviewed Foo Fighters with Taylor a mm-hmm. month, I think a month or so prior to Taylor's passing. But the drummer they had last night was the guy from Devo and Nine Inch Nails. Um, I think his name is John Freeze, Josh Freeze. I'll, I'll double check his name. Oh, he's their I, new guy, though, right? He Because he's a studio yeah. musician and he's apparently terrific. Dude, his resume. Josh Freeze, yeah. Josh, Josh Freeze. Dave, Dave did this entire resume thing for him last night, explaining how big of a deal Josh Freeze is in terms. Right. Of, I, that drummer was ridiculous. Like I, I, he 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 was incredible. And Nine Inch Nails. They, they, I mean, Nine Inch Nails alone, the technicalities of those drums and and that music, it makes sense why he's why he's up there in terms of like the 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 playability. But yeah, no, it was an incredible show, and the breeder breeders opened up for them, so. That's why I'm wearing this hat. But yeah, Kev, does he make awesome. everybody call him Mr. Freeze? <laughs> that's really funny. I, I was waiting for him to say, cool it or chill, <laughs> you know, like from Batman and Robin. When, uh, when uh, they, they tried to do like it's funny, like like Arnold's puns are so p- perfect over the years. But when they try too hard, they're I really thought you were bad. Say bad. No, well, no, no, I was, no, I was no, just about to ask you because like I feel like, you know, we we give Arnold so much credit, sure. you know, like for so many of like his one liners. But for so why do why are we all so just like. But is is chill really that no. much worse than some of the other ones? No, like why? I, but why? I, but I, why do we shit so much on him and Batman and Robin? But it's, it's tone. It's tone. It's also like like there's one. In, I remember seeing remember the movie Eraser that he did in the nineties. Yeah, sure. And of he course. shoot. And I think he shoots or I, I think there's a scene where he's fighting or he kills an alligator and he says your luggage like that. Like the, the, those, I assume he wrote none of those though. We're talking about yeah. giving him credit. I mean, yeah. yeah. But 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 Jake's Jake's point is like we we forgive his puns and his dialogue sure. in other films, but in Batman and Robin, yeah, yeah the, just, the puns it, think, are the same tone. level. But I feel like uh, like the, the movie not. that they're in, it's, it's based it's on the movie. Yeah, yeah, if you're having a good time, movie. you're like, oh, how fun! I'm having a good yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. He put a steam pipe through that guy's chest. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> that's let terrific. Off, I mean, let off some steam, Bennett is genuinely a great line. I mean, I, it, I actually the, I think that's my favorite. Then it was really high oh, strong. Dead yeah, tires, my favorite. <laughs> oh, dead tires, the best, no question. But like, let off some steam. Ben is a really solid line. I mean, they, I mean, he it literally makes sense. He was letting off some steam, and he was getting rid of stress. You Has know? Uh, have you signed up for Real Blend Premium yet? Because <laughs> if you would like to, uh, you get an ad free version of the of this podcast. And a newsletter uh, that comes from myself. Maybe this week I'll write about uh, Arnold puns. Maybe I'll rank my my favorite Dude. Arnold puns. I would I would actually Pretty like to read that. I will yeah. send it to you. I mean, uh, they're going to make yeah. you put that on the site though too. Check <laughs> the description like- for information on where you can sign up. All right, so uh, our guest this week is again returning guest Robert Rodriguez. Uh, 
when we spoke to him, it was for Alita. We got him Alita. for Alita, Alita but I feel like, but didn't we get him for something else? Was Alita was Alita the his, the first? It he was, was like Alita our second he guest. Talked because wasn't about making Alita. chocolates. He made he was a chocolatier. The thing with Alita wasn't I there, but you guys weren't, so I had yeah. to go be in a different room. Like I couldn't be in the room with Correct. him. Yes, because of the way we recorded it, so I had to like be in a separate room. It was. I, I remember something weird like that. Uh, well, I also remember we were so geeky in that one. Not that we're not all the time anyway, but we weren't really used to having guests yet. Yeah. And so we were the three of us were still very much like, oh, my God, we're talking to Robert Rodriguez for like this show awards blend that we'd <laughs> that we'd started. Awards blend. Did you yeah, know we used to be in a, an awards show? So yeah, it was probably real blend. It's still a really big deal. Like, it, it's funny. Like, I try to sometimes step out of my of my present self and kind of go back to my my teenage self because i would sit i would buy his dvds like the el mary i remember the el mariachi desperado double uh feature yeah. dvd that came out and on on everything going forward like from dust till dawn all those movies he had these amazing 10 minute film schools and he would like he would like a cooking schools he would do like different things and like his behind the scene there was a there was a from dust till dawn a uh, whole documentary about the making of it. I think it was called Full Tilt Boogie. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he was yeah, one of the I first that. he was one of the first filmmakers next to like Peter Jackson that my film school was Robert Rodriguez because El Mariachi was made for next to nothing. And the way he shot that and the way he got that movie made was so inspiring. What was and his like, book? Rebel Without a called, Crew Rebel or something like that? Crew. Rebel Without a Crew. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. it's all about right the making. So there, I think. And then Sean's it. book's right there. And then Sean's other book's yeah. right there. But hey, I just, I just wanted company. to give that give that context because like to toss to Robert Rodriguez on our show is a big deal. But like yeah, I yeah. also just want to explain like this is somebody that, you know, I still look up to in a very inspiring way about how he got into the business. I mean, the book Rebel Without a Crew that Sean mentions is crazy the stuff he did like this remember the science experiments gabe he would like take all these drugs and things like that he would put himself he's put his body at risk so he can make money so he can make a movie yeah. it was oh, like gosh. kind of a real like he, I don't, he was it was cr like experimental stuff like stuff it mm -hmm. was crazy anyways continue well without further ado uh, on that beautiful setup here's robert rodriguez returning to the real blend podcast to discuss the spy kids franchise <laughs> I am Sean O'Connell from Cinema Blend. Mr. Rodriguez, it's so good to see you again, sir. Hey, man. How you doing? I'm well. Good to be with you. Thanks uh, for joining me to talk about Spy Kids. I'm really excited to get into it with you. Look at that shelf you got back there. You need some, you need some more, you need to add some more things to your shelf. I, if you send them to me, I will put them front and center. Look at all those fun toys to play oh, around with there. Spy <laughs> Kids. Spy Kids. <laughs> Um, oh that see that that car is awesome in the movie so it's that so is really cool, cool. right it That's is the really cool. like, all the gadgets was like how do we make things that kids and adults would say i, I want that yeah yeah, yeah. So it's got gotta have this big road warrior look to it and and be aged down and then have a little bit of a whimsical color but not too much yeah it was a lot of fun designing all this stuff and of course you got to play a video game in order to get it to go so that's <laughs> that's the most important part <laughs> His son uh, came up with it. Yeah, I thought that was such a smart way to make the kids give the kids an edge. You know, like kids today are so much more technologically savvy than 20 years ago that they really are like spies already. They got iPhones, iPads, and they're they know to do things faster than adults. Of course, they they would beat them. Well, Robert, <laughs> uh, talk to me about what your son is like as a writing partner. I mean, it's a it's a lens that you're viewing him through now, you know, and you've worked with so many different people. What's he like collaborating with? You know, there's nothing like it. He's been he's been putting food on the table since he came up with Shark Boy and Lava Girl. He's <laughs> always had a, a imagination and he was the one who always took to writing. He would like write out scripts and try and wrangle and produce and produce, try to get the other brothers to like help him do this or that. Then one wouldn't cooperate, says, I'm writing Rebel out of the script. <laughs> <laughs> so I, would just, I would just let him go at it. I didn't know it was going to turn into his career, but it's something where, you know, if you and a writer are thinking on this, you would probably want to write with somebody that has references that you share, right? You like the same movies. You like the, that way you like speak each other's language. Well, we've been doing that for 26 years. Mm -hmm. So to have someone that's like got your DNA that way and, mm -hmm. and we know what makes each other laugh. We know what's dad's going to like this. They can present me stuff that I'm just like, yeah, I'm there. That's so cool. Of course, right, it's right. based on what we've always enjoyed together. You've got such a long history with them and they know the franchise from a different perspective as me. I created it. 
Mm. But they grew up with it being not being just in them, but getting to watch them with them and their friends and hearing what their friends thought about what their favorite parts were, what really, you know, spoke to them, what stuff stood the test of time. Mm -hmm. So they came back with a whole laundry list. One, we have to have a safe house. We mm -hmm. have to have the log names. We have to have a video game element back. That's what right. That's by kids three. That's what made it the most believable. We have to have this and that, and this the other stuff has to be fresh and new. So it was like so helpful, you know. And you now they're the age I was when I made Mariachi and Desperado. Now, so yeah. it's like they're like that. That's how I was back then. Like there's yeah. one point where I was a racer, and I was like, you know, sometimes you write some lines that I'm like, oh, I, I like that. And some I, I talked to him about, I'm going to talk to him about one line. I said, I, you know, I've been trying to live with this line. I just don't, I really, I still, I don't think they should be saying that. I just don't think they would say that. And he's like, yeah, okay. You wrote that. And uh, last week you said you were going to do this, this and that. I was like, I did. I don't remember that. Oh my God. Thank God he's here. How many things I would have missed. I was like, I got it all. He's got the memory I used to have at that age. And yeah. it's like, oh, God, you don't realize how much the brain ages until uh, you have a clone of yourself from that age, basically right there to remind you that you're slow slowing down it's so true uh you know you mentioned the video games that they were part of spy kids 3 and i know you guys had a i believe a game boy version of the game but video games are so sophisticated how have you guys ever had conversations about maybe bringing the, the characters into that type of world and exploring more either first person players or, or expanding that universe um i mean i would it would be great i mean i think that would be a lot of fun i think that's a great idea i know we are going to make a video game uh i don't know if it's been announced yet to coincide with this movie because of okay. the game element. Oh, really? So yeah, yeah. So that'll be, I think, announced tomorrow, maybe. Oh, okay. Excellent. Um, every time you guys get together for a new one of these, and it's been a while now, you're pushing the envelope in, term was, in terms of what you can do with cutting edge technology. Um, and you've been obviously refining everything through Alita and the Sin City films and all that. Uh, what's something that you can do now that you wish you were able to do on the 2001, on the very first one? I can't believe it's 2001. First off, it blows me away. You know, what's fun is when I'd go back and I'd show the kids, I was like, wow, look at the artwork I had for the original films. We never could accomplish that visually. We didn't have the budget. We didn't have the the technology to make the visuals. It never achieved the vision. If we could have done it that way, imagine what that would look like. Um, we actually filmed this exactly the same way as I filmed no kidding. Spike. It's same green screen, the exact same cabling. We're hanging the kids the same way. It's just the facts have gotten more sophisticated. And also we're doing this with Netflix, which they know the value of these movies. They know how well they perform. Mm -hmm. So we have a much better budget than we did like on the last movie or the movies before it. Right. Um, uh, so, uh, that's been the biggest difference. We didn't really change because I was really cutting edge back then. I was the first digital 3D movie with Spike Kids 3 mm -hmm. with two cameras. Nobody was shooting on green screen with digital and in stereo, it was like impossible. So we really didn't have to change our methods any. We were way ahead of ourselves back then, but it just looks much better. Like I even told the effects companies it only needs to look like they're in a video game, but it looks like they're really there. <laughs> they're like, okay, so here I can actually tell you about the game. So Roblox, is big oh. with the kids. Fox is doing a high score game called High Score Run. And that's going to be, uh, we announced it today. It's going to come out day and date. It's going to oh. be available already. That's uh, incredible. Week. Oh, that's really cool. Well, yeah, we got to go walk around in the world that we kind of created for the movie. And it's like, oh my gosh, how wish fulfillment is this for me and my kids? The game they've been working on on their own, they came up with this game as an independent game. And we put it in the movie because we needed a game in the movie. And now right. we got we got an actual version we can go play. That's so. incredible. Hey, I got to ask, are the skeletons a Harryhausen nod? Absolutely. This is a limited edition bronze. This thing is only like 50 or 100 of these of a skeleton from his maquette from uh, Jason and the Argonauts. Oh, my God. Where'd you get that from? A friend of mine who knows I'm a big fan of his. Yeah, it's only one of 82. Holy so cow. <laughs> um, and uh, I always loved that was always my reference for how the skeletons would move in Spike Kids 2 because it was a Harryhausen type movie, Spike Kids 2. Sure. Well, my son, when they were coming up with the game, 
They said, we always love the skeletons. We had to bring the skeletons back. So, okay, well, but what, we won't bring them back in smooth video game quality today. They'll still have the jittery <laughs> stop motion look. I loved that about it, though. Dude. About that. I need them to have that for me. That's my reference for skeletons. No, that was perfect. It, it's, it fit. It, it didn't fit the world you were it in. Fit, it fit, it, yeah. <laughs> but it fits <laughs> its own way. But that was it's really cool. You got to appeal to parents and grandparents who are like, yeah, that's what I, that's my, that was my <laughs> spike. Hey, hey, so there is a moment in, in this new story where the kids are going to violate their parents' rules and, and they're going to stay up to play the game. And it becomes a big catalyst for the way that the story goes. And, you know, I distinctly remember waiting until my parents fell asleep so I could go down and watch, you know, R-rated movies on HBO. Like, what do you remember doing? you know, that, that broke the rules just because you were so passionate about like, I have to stay up to do this or I've got to make this happen. Even though I was told I can't. Well, my, my sister and I, her name is Patty and my name was Tony uh, mm-hmm. growing up because my middle name was Anthony. So I always went by Tony okay. uh, until later they maybe use Robert for school. Said, That's your official name. I said, my middle name's Robert. No, I thought it was Tony. <laughs> um, and uh, we used to make a map of the hallway with the creeks in it. Did you? And we never worked. Yeah, that's where we came up with that. So she's she's going to see the movie tomorrow. I can't wait for her to see it because that was we blame each other. As, of course, the creeks aren't set in stone, so they would change nightly. It was like hey, this thing didn't creak last night. It never could work. Our parents would always hear us. We're trying to sneak downstairs to watch something on TV, and they would always hear us because it was the creakiest hallway ever. Um, but my kids told me that they used to do all kinds of that kind of stuff. They would. One would one would stand watch and the other one would go like turn on the machine and they would try to keep quiet. Those machines were so loud. They would try to play games late at night. I was like, you mischievous kids. What else did you do? Tell me so I can put it in the movie. Right, right. Uh, so a new addition to this cast is uh, Gina Rodriguez, who I just think has incredible, incredible comedic timing. Um, what's it like writing for her and what's it like seeing her sort of pull off the stuff you gave her? They're so amazing. Her and Zach were just always wanting to work together. They'd been writing something together. So they already had a chemistry. So when they saw they were going to co-star, they were like, oh, great. They walked on the set like that. They were just already, and, they, and they're and they great at just like, here's what's written. And then go ahead and just riff, you know, like you guys are supposed to be arguing while the kids are sneaking up the hallway. And they just, they just improvise that whole thing. They're both great improvisers. Right. So they're just wonderful. And they we're just making us laugh the whole time. Um, so much energy and chemistry is key. I try to pick people that have chemistry and they just had it already. So it was really great. You know, Robert, you have a stable of, of day players who show up in a bunch of your films and a lot of them have been in these spy kids movies. Is there anybody that you haven't gotten in yet that you're still hoping to to maybe work into a future film? Gosh, I don't know. I've gotten so lucky when I look back at all the people that I've worked with. And the thing with these family films is that sometimes some of them call me because they're like, I want to be in it. That's how Bill Paxton got to be in Spy Kids too. He, he called and said, I just saw Spy Kids and I saw this fun, great movie. And then there's Robert Patrick. And it's because he was in another movie with you. I should have been in that other movie. So then I could have gotten to be in a Spy Kids because my kid can't watch anything that I make. Right, but, right. So I would get calls from actors that want to be in it just so that their kid could watch something of theirs. And so I wrote him a role for Spy Kids 2 and 3, you know, but um, sometimes people want to be in a family film because they just have nothing of their work that they can show any kid. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so many brother kids are like, wait, what do you do again? I act. Well, can I see anything? Uh, not really. Show that kid true lies. It's never too early. <laughs> 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 Maybe skip up one or two scenes, but it's never too early. That just get most of it. <laughs> so you've been lucky enough to direct all of these films now at this point. Um, but I'm wondering if you could ever see very another. Rare. Was very that rare? Yeah, very rare. Absolutely. Think, and I'm there's wondering. Only one, there's only one other director who's directed five movies that he's written and created. Who's that? Quentin Miller. George Miller. Oh, oh, that's right. True. Very he's true. Doing, he's on his fifth Mad Max. Okay. So we're tied right now. <laughs> Anyways, you're going to say? I was going to say, could you ever imagine passing the baton to someone else? It's similar to the way that you get to play around in, in Lucas's sandbox with like, you know, Mando and, and Boba Fett. If, if you had a 
It's tough because the whole DNA of these are that they're, and it's the only movie series in existence that's made by a family for other families. Like mm-hmm. it's really made by a family. Like the Broccoli's do the James Bond movies, but they didn't write it and they created it too. You know, they're just producing it. So right. imagine no one's really had where they, and then directing and write each one. So you kind of have to make them, you know, making them, I could see passing on to my son if I'm no longer able to direct, but right. that would be a long time from now because George Miller is doing his next Mad Max right now. And those are hardcore and he's, he's up there at age, you know, he must be 70 or something. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Go for some time, you know, as a director. It's showing no signs of slowing down. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a it's like a bond series you know you could keep bringing this back for a new generation of kids that want empowerment that want imagination and creativity and, and be inspired and and there's always room for that you know one of the greatest things is seeing the franchise reach out into pop culture you know sometimes you'll see cosplayers maybe dressed up as as, as you know some of the spy kids or even shark boy and lava girl right. where's one of the coolest places that you've seen one of the characters from this franchise where you're like oh my god i can't believe that we're out here in this somebody just showed me oh yeah it was the producer the producer of the film uh don granger who produces uh you know like top gun and those mission impossible movies over at skydance he showed me a picture of his daughter who was now grown but back on spy kids her and her brother cosplaying and she had a plastic pirate knife and she's aiming it at the camera really hardcore i was like wow that's the coolest spy kid and she's going for blood. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> a five-year-old girl. I just thought that was the coolest thing. So that's that was amazing. That was my favorite cosplay picture was just how determined she looked to kill. It was, it was so funny. Well, Robert, I uh, have been lucky enough to go to Troublemaker. I'm always so blown away by what you're doing there from a technological standpoint. We always learn about it maybe four or five years down the line when we see something like Alita and we're like, holy shit, what has he been working on? What is something that you're refining right now, a tool or a technique that you think is about to break and become you know, a major player for people? Yeah, and I'm curious myself, you know, who came up with it? my kids, they were been watching me make these past two couple movies and they said, you know, seeing the challenge of the set, seeing how much we need to communicate with people, pre-visualization and also just kind of like pre-shooting the movie using right. technology today, using these programs, we're going to come to you with this this whole setup they're putting together. That's I can't wait to see because they've always been very innovative like that, like I was at their age. And now that they really see what how uh, things get lost in communication and in translation, how helpful it would be for us to just pre-visualize the whole movie. So that that's pretty exciting. I'm excited to see that. So I'll let you know next time because I'm not the brain behind it now. It's, it's my kids are taking over. Well, that's not a bad person to pass the baton to. Believe me, the next generation is right behind us trying to build on what we've done. So it's like that. It's like that scene in the movie when they say, wait, how did you do Operation Fireball? And they, we did this. And they go, mm, yeah, no, there's a better way than that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, no. how did you make the movie again? Yeah, yeah, there's a better way than that now. Did you know about this program? No. Oh, do you know about this program? No. Okay, watch this. No, I recently crossed the threshold now where I hand technology to my older kids and I just say, can you just do this for me? Because I, I used to be really good at that and now I just can't anymore. That's, that's okay. I accept that. I'm ready. <laughs> well, Robert, I really appreciate you coming on, man. It's always good catching up with you and congratulations on the film. Thanks. I appreciate it. We want to thank our good friends at Netflix and, of course, Robert Rodriguez for returning back to the show. I want to talk a little bit about Spy Kids Armageddon. And as you as he mentioned in the interview that you guys just listened to, um, one of the things I find pretty remarkable about this series is how cutting edge it was from the get go in terms of how he uses technology uh, and specifically green screen. He shot this entire film uh, at Troublemaker Studios in Austin. There are some scenes it's like a car chase scene uh, that happens um, in and around Austin, you can see the Texas State House, uh, and they're going down. I believe it's Congress Street. Uh, familiar with Austin, thanks to South by Southwest. Um, but all these props and things that Rodriguez is pulling out, like he has this really cool vehicle that he had designed specifically for the kids, um, and it's you know obviously inspired by a Mad Max type franchise. He talks about the influence that George Miller has had on this series, um, and then getting into the Harryhausen of it all, and that skeleton that he pulled out in the middle of it. That that's a reason if you're listening to the show and you want to go uh, watch us on the YouTube channel to see Robert Rodriguez pull this 
original Harryhausen uh, replica, essentially, or, or maquette, maquette is the name of the thing I'm trying to think of that they used for this stop motion animation and something like Jason and the Argonauts is just incredible to me um the film armageddon is fine it's i want people to know that it's not necessarily a sequel it doesn't build off of the existing characters that you've seen in the other films it's a whole new family um who are still uh the parents are are spies the kids sort of figure it out and then they have to go on their own mission to sort of help the parents out but it doesn't have any sort of step down or you know or lose a, a beat in terms of the way that rodriguez plays with his technology because he's been refining these techniques the entire time and that's kind of why at the end of the interview i asked him like what do you see coming next you've always sort of been evolving what the the latest high-tech technology is and it's interesting to hear him because, Kev, you're talking about, you know, how long he's been around and right. and to hear him talk about being 50, you know, or in his 50s now and being ready to watch the next generation, you know, come up and start to invent things that that he hasn't even thought of and how he talks about when, you know, when he was doing El Mariachi, he was learning all this stuff on the fly. And now it's the next generation's, you know, time to sort of push through and figure all this stuff out. Well, it's fascinating to me and going back to the discussion we were having at the top of the show about Rodriguez and the special features on his movies. My favorite special feature of all time was on Sin City because he basically took the entire film, sped it up, I think, to like 500 percent or whatever. And you can watch the entire Sin City in 12 minutes, full green screen version. So like the entire majority of the film was shot on green screen. So everything was added in post. Like, for example, if Marv Mickey Rourke is walking somewhere or Bruce Willis, they're on a treadmill. It's green and it's just continually moving and moving. And if you want to see how movies are made, especially in in the regards to what Sean's talking about, seek out that feature. Um, it's it'll just give you a little insight. And basically what Sean is saying about Troublemaker, Troublemaker is a whole film studio. Like it's an mm-hmm. incredible thing, filming, editing, scoring. We have, we all know. I mean, Jake and I went to New Zealand a couple of years ago for Alita and, you know, uh, Robert Rodriguez was on set with a guitar scoring you while you were wearing a performance capture suit being directed by him. And you could see yourself in the monitor through the performance capture at Weta. Um, his mind, he's a kid. I mean, he's like a little kid at a candy store when he's making these movies. And that's why I'm so happy that we have him on, especially if anybody listening to the show is an aspiring filmmaker or, or wants to, you know, you don't need the biggest budgets in the planet to make these movies. Um, and yeah, seek that out. I well, mean, I obviously, love, yeah, I love how he transitions so easily back and forth between, you know, a from dusk till dawn or, yeah. you know, a planet terror. Yeah. <laughs> and then he can turn around and, and do, a, you know, a ch- another chapter in the Spy Kids franchise. Like he's right. he's that versatile. And uh, and, and the obviously Spy Kids has films, a love for. They still have his voice. They still it still feels like a Robert Rodriguez movie. That's the cool part about it. Like even even though they are made for kids, it still has. Have you ever seen a movie, a short film he did called Bedhead? No, Um, go back. So go back. um, This is a really cool thing for our listeners. Go back on YouTube. Type in Robert Rodriguez Bedhead. It's it's one of the first films he ever made. I think he made it way before uh, El Mariachi. You'll see everything you see in his movies nowadays. It's all there. Everything, sound design, editing, the quick shots, the way he was doing things. He's one of the most extraordinary. That's why filmmakers like James Cameron love him. Like mm-hmm. Rod- Rodriguez is that classic guy who just changed the game in terms of what you could do with low budget filmmaking. El Mariachi is mm-hmm. incredible. Desperado was incredible. Dust Till Dawn, these movies didn't cost a ton to well, make it all. And Cameron, when Cameron couldn't do Alita, he, he yeah. passed it to Rodriguez. Like right. if that's not the greatest, <laughs> you know, vote of confidence in your abilities as a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, and Alita had incredible special effects. Like I actually really liked Alita. I thought Alita was a it was, it was an underrated film. Um, also, some of the most extraordinary performance capture we've seen. I mean, like like we're getting to a point now where it's starting to become so photo real. Um, obviously, you know, it's still a little bit to go. Even you know, look at the de aging in Indy Five. It's still not quite there, um, but, you know, we're getting there. But Rodriguez, you know, you got to give him credit for being on the forefront of a lot of this technology. Like Zemeckis, too. Zemeckis doesn't get a lot of credit for performance capture, um, mm-hmm. and he should. I mean, he was he was really early on with Polar Express and things like that. So, yeah, I'm very happy he's on our show. And thank you to Mr. Rodriguez for joining us. It's kind of an honor. So, um, so Jakey, you're the only one of us who've seen this new film that I'm super intrigued about. Um, 
from Brian Duffield, who yeah. uh, had a terrific movie called Spontaneous. I'm not sure if that was his first movie or not. Gabe, can you check and see? I'm not sure if that was his directorial debut. He's following up with a movie now that's called um, No One Will Save You. And it stars uh, Caitlin Deaver, who I also like very much and was also on our show uh, yep. for Ticket to Paradise. If you want to go back and listen to Caitlin Deaver. Um, that was fun. That was, that was fun his first, on. first film he directed. Yes. Was that was his first film. So if yeah. you haven't seen Spontaneous, it's really terrific. Um, it's a high school horror comedy where people in the senior class just start to spontaneously combust. Like in the middle of class, they just explode. Um, and you start to figure out why this is happening, but he goes all out with the special effects and the gore, like practical effects and gore in terms of making it work. Um, and it has some terrific performances in it. So I was really excited to see what he does next. And then the trailer for this one, no one will save you looked terrific. So please tell me that we're going to get something borderline special with this. Yeah. I like this movie a lot because it does something that I give Spielberg a lot of credit for with with War of the Worlds and the reason that I like lore, War of the Worlds as much as I do. It's a small alien film. Um, and at no point is it concerned about showing how the aliens are handling the White House or showing, mm. you know, the you know, the, the ships hovering over, you know, different uh, recognizable places on the planet. At no point does she walk by a TV screen and a news update shows different, uh, you know, monuments being taken down by the aliens. It's a small farmhouse where a young girl lives by herself and all of a sudden aliens start invading. Mm. And it's that small intimacy of how it handles this tight knit community uh, is one of the main reasons that I like the movie as much as I do. Um, she, Caitlin Deaver is fantastic. Uh, there is very little dialogue in the film to the point where about halfway through it's very tight 90 minute runtime. I sort of paused Beautiful. and thought like, has she spoken yet? Like, right. I don't think she's spoken. Um, it, it moves at a clip, man. It is, it is the antithesis of jaws if Jaws uh, took a while to, to show you the shark, if Alien took a while to show you the xenomorph, within five minutes, Brian is going, hey, this is an alien movie and this oh, is the alien cool. that we're working with. Good, uh, good, good. At, at like no that. point, you know, there's there's a, a brief maybe 90 second period where because I got to be honest, I pressed play not knowing what it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so I for 90 seconds, I thought, is this like a like a uh, the strangers, like a, like a home invasion kind of film? And then within 90 seconds, well, oh, no, aliens. Fucking aliens. <laughs> um, but I think I think it's handled very well. It's there are some familiar elements to it, but handled in a very fresh way. And there are a lot of really fresh elements to it. It very much both for better or for worse goes off the rails in the third act in a lot of ways that I don't want to reveal. But there was never a moment where I wasn't wanting to know what was going to happen next. There was never a moment where I wasn't engaged. Um, it's a really tight, uh, powerful alien invasion film uh, a mean alien invasion film which i like and uh everything from what the alien looks like because you know when when i feel like when a filmmaker when a storyteller makes an alien film there are a couple of big decisions that are forks in the road that you have to make right off, right off the bat right at the beginning sure. are they are they mean aliens or are they good aliens are they here to impart wisdom or do they want to kill us and another one is uh what are they going to look like uh, or do we do they are they a new kind of creature that we've sort of never seen before? Do you risk trying to come up with something new and having it look stupid or do you go classic little gray alien man? And yeah. some of the decisions he made, I really dug um, there. I do think there are a couple of special effects problems there. There are a couple of shots where the alien alternates between CGI and practical. And okay. I think when the alien looks practical, it looks fantastic. Um, when the alien looks CGI, I think it's a reminder of maybe how much of a limited budget they were working with. But overall, this is a really fresh, cool take on on a type of film that we've seen before and i would you know considering it is a 90 minute press play on hulu could not recommend it enough awesome okay um we will tease that we have a sort of hashtag if it happens where we'd like to get brian duffield on the show and specifically we're aiming that would have been to do... really awkward if i were like man it was shit <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it would have killed the chances of getting him um we're going to hopefully do a spoiler deep dive with him where we can really yes. talk about once it is, once it's out and people can, I will pull the curtain back and say it is booked, but as we always say, it hasn't happened until it's happened. Right. Exactly. Yes. Um, what, but we're the, you know, easing into a spooky season because, yeah. uh, 
So that's a good good one oh, for spooky speaking season. Speaking of spooky and, season, we've got some great hashtag if it happens spooky seasons pitches out there. I'm just saying. That's true. We do. Yeah, yeah we won't we won't talk about those yet. Those are yeah. I mean, those are the, the, this, you know, the, the <laughs> scariest one being, you know, the, the the killers of the flower moon. You know, it's just going to yeah. be a really uh, well, that's, ooh, nothing uh, says, yeah. nothing I mean, says spooky probably season. Even, uh, probably be the most scared if that's the one we booked. <laughs> <Yeah. though. laughs> oh, by the way, Kev, I don't know if you know this, but did you know uh, Mario Lopez uh, recently announced uh, his favorite his favorite uh, person from the Saw franchise? Did you know? Save, save by the Tobin Bell. God oh, damn it, Jake. Nice. Why would yes. you ruin that for me? Sorry. Jake, I, I thought on. that was the idea. <laughs> that was great. Well, uh, that's really, look, really I good. I so rarely <laughs> get them, and I'm going to get chastised one of, the, one of the few <laughs> moments that it actually Save comes to me. Bell. <laughs> Honestly, that should have been the title of Saw 10. That, that's a way better title. And it takes place in high school. With the whole, uh, with Mr. Mr. Was with it the Mr. entire Be- cast, Mr. Belding, Mr. Belding. Am I going to be able to um, next week? Am I going to be able to talk Saw? Because I've seen Saw Ten. Am I going to be able to see it? Am I going to talk to it, talk about it? I mean, yeah. No, you have to talk I've about got, Fast Ten. I've got thoughts. Say. Yeah, of course. It's it's my my it's my favorite of the X films this year. Uh, <laughs> interesting. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. Have there only been two? Is there one I'm not thinking of? Yeah, you can pull Jason X off the shelf if you want to. <laughs> hey. He goes hey, space. That has one of my favorite Jason deaths. Uh, is it the cryogenically frozen yes, face? Of course. Yeah, that one's terrific. Of course. <laughs> That's one of those kills that I'll just never forget yeah. at all. Very similar to the um, the Freddy girl who gets treated oh, like a yeah. puppet with her yes. veins coming out. I think that's in Dream Warriors. Oh, yeah, Dream Warriors, crazy. baby. Oh, just the um, s- mentioning uh, it hurts my arms. Yeah. All right, there, so, is uh, a, um, there is a death in Saw X that's just going to make you go... Uh, Wait, are they calling it Saw X? Is Saw that what X. they're actually saying? Yeah, it? Saw X. Oh, that's so dumb. Oh, before just... we get off the spooky season thing, Jake, I finished the rewatch of Bly Manor. <gasps> so Ooh. good. I, I feel like I forgot how good Bly Manor is because I, I was so blown away by Midnight Mass that I was like, this one rips, dude. This is so yeah, good. Yeah, I, I think I think I sleep a lot on Bly Manor because it had so much more of a um like a gothic romance and I think not I was a, hoping it's for. Not a scary, scary, and, 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 and Hill yeah. House I think is one of the greatest pieces of horror in any medium ever. Yeah. The Haunting yeah. of Hill House. And, and Midnight Matt, that is true for me for those. And Midnight yeah. Matt is one of just my favorite things ever. Like yeah. And, Midnight, those, and like Blind Manor kind of came in between yeah. those. Right? So yeah. I think like I just love Midnight Mass and I love Brilliant. Hill House. So that like Blind Manor just sort of felt like a that's good. Well, Midnight good. Mass is extraordinary. Like it's like uh, it's that, incredible. I don't know what, which one I think is better that or Haunting of Hill House. I'm, I mean, I'm both. doing a I'm doing a Flanagan Netflix rewatch. Ooh. I don't know if I'm going to get them all in before. Uh, I mean, we're that's coming up on. Uh, uh, what the heck am I thinking of? Fall of the House few, of Usher. Few things haunt me more than the fact that you have a lost picture taken on the set <laughs> in the Overlook Hotel. Like that really, that really, it, really it bothers me. It's not even my picture, but it really bothers me. There is a, a, a lovely, kind PR person who has a photo of me and Mike Flanagan on the steps in the Overlook Hotel that they failed to send me. And, uh, <laughs> you know, now it's just they for overlooked. Me. Sending Sending it to you. Oh. There we go. All right, all right. Yeah, Sean, right. do you want to introduce our next segment? Or do you want me to take the wheel? I'll let you take it right from there, Gabe. All right, Sean's gonna check. Sean's done for the day. We're gonna send him home. Go stretch in the locker room, Sean. Uh, yeah, so we're bringing back. Uh, if you're a premium subscriber and have been for a long time, we are bringing back our Oscars in review segment, um, in which we take a look at an old. Oscars ceremony um, and we take a look at some of the major categories we might poke around a few others as we have time for and as we're interested to uh, but we're going to take a look at who was nominated more importantly we're going to take it take a look at who won and now with the the benefit of hindsight and time uh, these three well all four of us are going to discuss whether or not the Oscars got it right or the Academy got it right um, or they got it wrong um, and maybe pitch some some replacements if we have them as we go. Um, I think that's all the setup it needs. It'll make sense as as we're going. But this week we are going to do. I figured twenty years was a good place to start on the main feed. Uh, we're going to start with the two thousand and three Oscars, uh, which was twenty years ago, uh, which were celebrating movies released in two thousand and two. Oh. And as per 
Yes. That's intriguing. Yes. Okay, so, that's so intriguing. it's a ceremony from 20 years ago. I yes. always have to remember that, yes. And when that's I hear 2002, I, it's kind of like when we play that that game where we have to guess the years kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but then when I hear 2002, my mind goes to a bunch of different places. Yeah, so so the films came out in 2002, celebrated in 2003. Uh, we are going to start with actor in a supporting role. Actor in a supporting role. So we have. I do want to point out that this game usually makes me really angry. Too, it does. It does. Oh, there's. The there's gets it very wrong. There is a dearth of a certain <laughs> all time director. Uh, <laughs> and not just him in that category, but just his films that he had this year in, in their entirety. Just not. I'm afraid. Not I'm mentioned. Really afraid. So this will be fun. Um, nominated, we have Christopher Walken for Catch Me If You Can. John C. Riley in Chicago, mm-hmm. oh. Paul Newman in Road to Perdition, Ed Harris for The Hours, and winning is Chris Cooper for Adaptation. Look, I, I know I'm biased. I know you're all going to look at me and roll your eyes and say whatever, but like Paul Newman deserved to win that. Like Paul I know. Newman, Paul Newman in Road to Perdition was like I'm. He said more in his last line in that movie than most of the other performances nominated like that. That performance is just flawless and it really bothers me that he didn't win. I will say I don't hate Chris Cooper winning for adaptation. He's terrific in that part. He's very good. He's very good in that. Now, honestly, a walk in is fantastic and catch me if you can walk in is really good in that. Yes, that, well, that so. moment where like there's a moment with him and DiCaprio in the booth when you can clearly tell just because like Frank Jr. is a con artist and he kind of learned it by watching his dad that that Walken knows DiCaprio's up to something and he's given him that whole speech about like everyone here is trying to figure out like you're a pilot and where you're going and he kind of takes that beat and he goes where are you going Frank and that yeah, moment yeah, yeah. where you can just tell like he's saying one thing but he's meaning it. it's just that that's a great great performance. Well, you, and it's a, okay, it's a lot with walking. I'm sorry, Gabe. It's a lot with walking where like he gets away with just being walking every mm-hmm. once in a while. But that's one of those times where like he legit played a character, mm-hmm. you know, who mm-hmm. had it was invested emotionally mm-hmm. in the story yeah. that was being told and, you know, got to play off of yeah. off of Leo. He, and I, I don't want us to necessarily dismiss John C. Riley in Chicago. As sure. Well, he's too, great. Oh, he's great because he's terrific in that part. I know his, yeah. he gets his big Mr. Cellophane song. Yeah. But like he has to sell being in Roxy's shadow, you know, for that song to work, essentially. And so it wasn't that wasn't a nomination that just because Chicago is sweeping through and and everybody in it was getting nominated. He's legit great in that movie. That's what I was going to ask, because I was but a wee child uh, during this Oscar run. But Chicago was kind of that behemoth that maybe was made everything look like not cool. You know, like, ah, he's just another one from this long list. It's that that movie was a, an awards juggernaut. I was and young, a, but I'll say I do remember that being a massive thing, even even being that young. But a, a crowd pleasing movie too, like it it works and convinced a lot of people that Rob Marshall should get jobs for the next few years. <laughs> still, <laughs> to this day, to this day, yes. the, the really fact good. that Rob well, Marshall movie is still on the poster, say from the director of Chicago, yeah. and nothing else <laughs> over the last twenty years. <laughs> His resume after that is dicey. <laughs> to say um, the least. Kevin, you had mentioned you're you're okay with that list. You're you're happy with it. I assume you like Chris yeah. Cooper in the role. Oh yeah, I think Chris Cooper is incredible. I mean, Paul Newman's amazing in that, but I think that Paul. I mean, when I think of Road to Perdition, I think of a lot. Of, I think of a lot of other things outside of just Paul Newman. Um, I think Paul Newman's obviously phenomenal in that film. I mean, I would love to have seen him win for that, but I, I think Chris Cooper is outstanding in adaptation. I think it's. I think it's an a phenomenal film and a phenomenal performance. I also think Chris, one of Chris Cooper's best performances ever was American beauty. Um, I don't know if he Mm -hmm. was nominated. Was he nominated for that? I think so. Yeah. Uh I just remember, I'll remember the scene in the garage Mm. with him and Kevin Spacey. I just remember that scene. And I remember uh, the final scene between them two. Right. Isn't there a scene like, in the garage like, where he's lifting, he's lifting weights or something like that? Is, am, I, am I thinking, am I imagining something different? There's a scene in the garage where he confronts him. He confr- is, isn't it the bit that like he, they kiss. He, start, yeah, he starts to yeah. question his sexuality and, and then, and then yeah. Spacey rejects him, which is what causes him to go home, get the gun yeah. and then come back. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's what it's a, like an incredible scene. It, uh, it's like, he was not yeah. nominated. Oh, wow. Well, it looks like it looks like adaptation is his only nomination and win unless IMDb is changing the way they do things, which is not mm. uh, totally unlikely. But 
Yeah, I, I think I, I think Chris Cooper is one of the one of the most underrated actors working in our business. He's like that guy is a safe bet in terms of you put him in something. You're going to feel that. <laughs> and he's and he's just amazing. Um, well, that's I a great category. I wanted yeah. to mention I'll quickly mention this because we've got plenty to get to. But I wanted to get your guys's reactions quickly. I looked around to try to find some resources from around that time or people who have written about. Um, potential snubs, and I see Colin Farrell mentioned for Minority Report. Nah. Um, circus for Two Towers. Um, and then I, I mean, s- if I mean, if they weren't giving it to him by the time we were already at Apes, they definitely weren't going to give it to him for Two Towers. They they just didn't have the mindset of yeah accepting that motion and capture. Then, they um, still don't. Yeah, exactly. I assume Same this is voice a, acting. A Jake, I'd be curious. If, I assume this is a. Um, just put one horse in the race, but Jude Law for Road to Perdition. Yeah, honestly, like I was thinking about like Jude, you could make a really solid case for, for Jude. I think I think so much was played up for Newman. Do you think because that's the sort Newman's, of thing where he's like, I don't want to campaign I, this I'd year? Actually, well, Newman didn't even show up for the Oscars. Uh, well, yeah, I would uh, argue that Jude Law, I think of Jude Law, when I think of Road to Perdition, the scene that hits me is the sound of the waves and we're up in that like room with, Tom Hanks mm-hmm. and, and Jude Law and Jude Law has all that, like all those yeah. scars on his face. And I just remember like that scene horrified me, like the, the kid down on the beach or whatever. Yeah. And like it was a whole thing. That's like, some Academy Award winning cinematography by the by the great Conrad, Conrad L. Hall. His yeah. last, so, he won he won posthumously. It was his last uh, last win. He had passed first, away by the time they had the I, Oscars. I would argue Jude Law. I mean, again, Paul Newman has already had already proven himself, you know, Color of Money, you know, Hustler. I, I, there's so many amazing films that he had done, Butch Cassidy and everything like that. But Cars. Yeah, I think Jude Law. Yeah. yeah. Jude Law. <laughs> Jude Law, though, man. Wow. Like that. That's probably. Might be my favorite Jude Law. Wow. That's a, that's a big. That's a big oh, statement. Mr. That's a bold Ripley's got to be up yeah, there, I was going to say, uh, Ripley's up there for me. Forgive oh, yeah. me that, for not knowing yeah. Perdition as well. Does Newman get a lot of scenes in that yeah. movie? Or is he, it one where he, he gets yeah, a, he's, he's, he's the scene. Yeah. And, and he's he's in it throughout. He's he's basically the godfather. OK. Yeah. Um, he's he's Mr. Rooney. He is the guy that um, really the reason I think he arguably gives the best performance is he has to be torn between his real son, who is played by a young unnamed actor named Daniel Craig. Um, and then sort of his surrogate son played by Tom Hanks. And he's got these very, he's got a lot of very internal um, struggles that that he being Paul Newman and his eyes being so famous, I think famously says everything in his eyes. How that amazing movie. that Daniel Craig walked away from the Bond franchise and stepped into the Glass Onion yeah. franchise. Beautiful. <laughs> good for him. I honestly, honestly, well, let's out. just let's just make that the next Bond. Make him a, a, a real fun <laughs> Kentucky uh, detective. What is it? What is uh What is it that uh, Chris Evans' line is? CSI, yeah. KFC, 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 yeah, KFC. and as he like puts something in his mouth and walks away. God, walks he's so brilliant in that movie. Yeah. It's a perfect movie. Um, actress in a supporting role, nominated. Oh we have, which I think we could just fill in every single year. Uh, Meryl Streep for adaptation. Uh, Queen Latifah for Chicago. Okay. Julianne Moore for The Hours, Kathy Bates for About Schmidt, and mm-hmm. winning is Catherine Zeta-Jones for Chicago. All right. I am giving that award to uh, Kathy Bates. I was, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about Kathy yeah. Bates, too. I was just thinking, I was like, yeah. I feel like Kathy Bates is great in About Schmidt. Yeah, I think she, I think I, she I, gets it. I freaking love Kathy Bates. I, I honestly, like... Yeah, I, Kathy Bates, man. The the way people talk about and not to Was she knock nominated Meryl for Street, Misery, Jake. She won for Misery. She won lead or supporting lead, lead actor, lead actress for Misery. Wow. wow. The, the way people talk about Meryl Streep is how I think I see Kathy Bates, where oh, she's yeah. just brilliant and not in everything. No, not necessarily not Streep, but I feel like the way people talk about Streep is just like, oh, she's just amazing and everything yeah, yeah, and she'd yeah. be nominated for everything that she does and to me that's kathy bates i feel like honestly to me if the idea of an actor is to disappear so that you don't see them kathy bates does that for me more than meryl streep does interesting um i want to just pull up her uh her and, and, and is it because kathy bates did big bang theory not necessarily <laughs> she did the office but it doesn't well hurt too. and she, she was great she's in the great. oh wait kevin she's have you gotten to kathy office. bates in the office uh, no, I have not. Oh, I'm she's dude, she has I, a great I, I, run in the office. 
I just so yeah, I'll, I'll update. I'm on season five. I just watched Dinner Party. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Did you like I would, it? I would pay to see that perform live. That, dude, him him pushing the TV back into the wall is one of the hardest I've ever laughed. You what you laugh harder? Go watch the bloopers from that scene because oh, I've, John, I've seen it. Wait, John can't yeah. hold himself. He just sees him do it. He just can't. I don't, I don't can't think I was ready it. for how dark that episode was going to be. Yeah, because like because the the tone and for people who've never seen The Office, the tone leading up to that. I mean, the show deals with heavy subject yeah. matter, of course. Sure. That's kind of the, shows of all time. No, I'm just kidding. Well, it's also one of the <laughs> one of the things that, again, from a perspective of somebody watching The Office for the first time, yeah. what I love about the show is its ability to be silly. But then it, at, at any given moment, it can it can take a turn into very serious subject matter. And that episode dinner party I had heard was phenomenal. But I don't when I sat down to watch, it, I was expecting something really funny. And I think I was just shocked by how I felt so bad for Michael in that in that whole episode, like, the mm -hmm. you know, that whole scenario with him and Jan. Like, it, it's you know, again, and it, this is a topic everyone knows already about, but that's where I'm at. I'll keep y'all. I'll keep updating y'all. But I just watched that episode. So that's where I'm at right now. My favorite character on that entire show is Toby. I think Toby is brilliant i think that character is so well written and paul lieberstein i think is the gentleman who plays him he's obviously a writer and a big part of the production of that show that character to me is just genius like See, there you're was not an even yeah. you're not even yeah. at my favorite character on that entire show yet uh what? really amy ryan's uh oh i haven't Holly got oh i haven't gotten to any of that stuff i haven't greatest. even gotten I'm on season four. I mean, I'm still I'm still early in season. I'm halfway through season four. Dude, I, I you've think got some great guest stars coming your way. And Paul Feig directed Dinner Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the and the one after it, the next episode after that, he directed as well. Dessert um, Party. Yeah. Well, no, I think I did. I see J.J. Abrams name pop up. the other Yeah, J.J. Abrams. Yeah, they're like there are some big names directing really? episodes of. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I love any, it. And Jake's been trying to get me to watch this for a long time. Anyways, continue. Any. Um. Final thoughts on actress in a supporting role. I, I'd give it to yeah, I'd give it to Bates to be honest with you. Bates, cool. Also, I don't think Catherine Zeta Jones did enough in Chicago to warrant. Uh, like I think I think she got kind of got swept up in the momentum of of that. Movie. Yeah, and also I think you know like that was a very peak time for Catherine Zeta Jones, and I think you know she that may have fallen into the like oh this seems like a good one to give mm. her the Oscar for. Actor in a leading role. Oh boy. Nominated. We have Jack Nicholson for About Schmidt. <laughs> this category. Oh, he lost. He lost. Wow. Daniel Day Lewis for Gangs of New York. <laughs> I'm already pissed. Wow. Stop wait, the till game. You, wait till you find out who wins. Michael Stop the game. Michael Caine. For The Quiet American. Oh, he's so good in that movie. He's brilliant in The Quiet American. Nicolas mm. Cage for Adaptation. Oh, oh shit. They wow. fucking, all four of them lost and, and, to and Richard them, Gere. And winning no. to Richard Gere. Is, no, winning Gere's never been nominated. Is Adrian Brody for The Pianist. Fuck you. Fuck that. <laughs> fuck, honestly. Honestly. That's okay. the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Dude, you wait, can tell wait, wait, the wait. Oscars the didn't even think he was going to win because they had him all the way to like the far left side of the theater. Like in the TV section? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I feel, I, feel like this, I feel like this is almost like a Nickelback situation. We were discussing this last week where like the pianist is kind of like the out, like the one I leave that for it's, one it's, week it's, and we do a segment on Nickelback. It's like, <laughs> 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 the, the, re the reason why I said that is because we, last week on the show, Sean had seen the Nickelback documentary at TIFF and we were talking about the discussion about why people hate Nickelback because they, people don't really hate them. It's just a commonality thought of like, oh, that's that's just a band everyone hates. My point is out of this list, I feel like the pianist feels like an outlier, even though it's a phenomenal performance. It really is a great performance. I mean, clearly it is a great performance it is compared a, a to the other ones, performance. Yes. But compared to the other ones, of course. I mean, like the. Did you say Daniel Day Lewis for Gangs in New York? Yes. Gangs I mean, like, in New York. That, that yes. then Bill then the Butcher. No, Bill the Butcher no, deserved no the question. That or that out of that list, Cage for you said Cage for adaptation, Cage, right? Yep. Yeah, I I love Cage for adaptation. I just think that huh? Uh, hey, twins. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, you watch Leaving Las Vegas, um, which he some won notable, for. Some notable uh, people left out. I, I saw some, Minority Report got a lot of mentions. Tom Cruise. I feel like I don't know that that breaks the I, uh, sort of is mold. minority 
report an awards player? I, I thought that was just like a. Son I think of it's just because it's Spielberg. I think. Yeah, but yeah, that, that was one up. of the 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 Spielberg years where he had like the summer blockbuster and then the more Oscar friendly. Well, so he had Minority Report and, but, Dicap- and, and, and DiCaprio yeah. wasn't mentioned for yeah, Catch, Catch Me, me can. can. I I okay. again I know like whatever Jake you know I'm biased or whatever but like Tom Hanks for Road to Perdition. Oh jeez, wow! Not even yeah. not even in the not, conversation. Yeah. Like one of one of his best performances. Uh, Gene Hackman was in the conversation. I'm sorry, I got that. Oh, well done, well done. I I haven't seen this movie in years, and I think when I saw it, I was I was too young. Yeah, okay, that did come out this year. Uh, would you have nominated Robin Williams for One Hour Photo? That is that honestly. That's, that's that a is, great performance. That's a great performance. I, I wouldn't see. It's funny because like this goes back to the discussion about Andy Serkis. Um, and and what I what I'm I, I mean by that is like the the performance capture element of that and you know you go back to robin williams the, he should have won and been nominated for aladdin i mean but they just don't get the voice acting perspective of it but one hour photo going you know that is one of his that's an extraordinary performance really disturbing film because he was doing a lot of those at that time right what was that movie he did he, had, that, Bob, he did Bob, well Bob that Cat? year was 2002 was insomnia as well wasn't it so yes, he was kind of on the, that dark string. He went darker. Yeah. What am I? What am I thinking of? Bob Bobcat. What am I? You mean what, Father what? of the Year? Death to Smoochie. He, yeah. No. Oh, it was a, Smoochie. The director who did. Um, he went. For, I mean, up. he went dark. Uh, you know, in, in, a, yeah. in a bunch of roles. Uh, what Bobcat Gold, to, Gold Goldthwait. Uh, he directed a movie with. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was called World's Greatest Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't that a wasn't that's that a pretty a dark, dark film? That's right. a dark, dark right. movie. Yes. And so the, the reason I bring that up is because that's I think one hour photo was around that time. What year is one hour photo? Oh, it's two thousand two. We're talking about that yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So oh, okay. So he dude. So, dude, so one he had hour photo, was, photo and it's Omnia the same year. Wow. Yeah, so wait, who was, are we giving this to? Who are we giving it to? Dude, if it's, it's not Daniel Day Lewis, Daniel Day Lewis. And I still remember Daniel Day Lewis was the favorite going into that night. It was a it was a shocker. That Brody won, which is why, which led to like his crazy shock and his running up and kissing of Halle Berry. Like that's DiCaprio had Catch Me If You Can and Gangs of New York in the same year. Yeah, same year. Yeah, Spielberg and Scorsese. Oh, that and was the, that was, get nominated for that was the night with the kiss. I didn't realize yeah. that that was yeah. the same. Oh wow, I remember that now. I do remember that. Okay. See, mm. they used to kiss people at the Oscars, and now they're slapping presenters. And <laughs> <laughs> we've That's devolved the, as a society. That, <laughs> that is the weirdest form of like in my day. In my day, in my day, we kissed the presenters. We inappropriately kissed people at the Oscars. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Now we slapped them now against we, their will. Inappropriately, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Maybe we should cancel the Oscars altogether. Say, maybe we should stop doing the Oscars. <laughs> maybe that's. Yeah. The, yeah. that's, that's I mean, that's, they're giving Adrian Brody an Oscar over everyone else in that category. Dude, so I'm t- his his performance is really. great great in that movie I think it that, is that's it, what, is good. Yeah, it really just, is a good performance in, uh, I was just in Vegas uh, with, with my girlfriend and and while she was getting ready uh, you know you, what you do what all boyfriends do which you just turn on the TV and like have a drink watch while, the penis like, yeah. well uh, one of the Oceans movies was on and I think it was 13 and I completely forgot that like Matt Damon has to put on a disguise to go do like part of oh, the yeah. bit his and, big nose and, right? and the big nose and they call it the Brody Oh, do they? They're really? like, the That's Brody funny. works. The Brody works. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. I Someone sent a text to Brody about that. I assume oh, yeah. to uh, hilariously laugh at that. Yeah. 13 um, is terrific. Pacino's oh, I terrific. Love 13. Oh, Pacino's Alan, amazing. Alan Barkin's great in that movie. Yeah. I, that honestly, I love, I love 13 so much. Yep. All right. Moving on. We have actress in a leading role. Nominated. <sighs> Can I ask a quick question? If it's quick. Isn't it weird that Daniel Day Lewis was lead? You think yeah, he was yeah. more su- I, I thought he was more supporting. That is weird. No, I think that is weird. That's category when I, fraud. When uh, I look at that, when I look at Gangs of New York, I, I honestly, uh, just, I don't know. I think of Gangs of New York. I think DiCaprio is DiCaprio's the lead. I think they're a co- kind of a co-lead. co-lead. Because, because the story is because there's a lot of them. there's a lot of scenes of Bill the Butcher. Oh, I know. It's just him. Yeah. I just it's so weird. I I always thought of that like okay like if you're looking clearly like Phantom Thread. He's lead Lincoln. He's lead. I always looked at him as a supporting role in gangs. It's interesting. I think I think there's cheating back back to actress in a leading role nominated. We have Renee Zellweger for Chicago. Hmm. Julianne Moore for Far From Heaven, which is a lot to say. Uh, Diane Lane for Unfaithful. Hmm. Salma Hayek for Frida and winning is Nicole Kidman for The Hours. I have a hot take on this. 
Okay. I'm gonna go Diane. I'm gonna go Diane Lane for unfaithful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, yes, sir. I am too. I, the the eyes fil- have it. <laughs> I am too. That film, like it's her and Richard Gere, and then yes. I that film is highly underrated, and she is phenomenal. I actually, honestly, until this moment, had no idea she was nominated for an Oscar for that film. Kevin, I'm with you. I uh, love I'm the only nomination. And here's the thing about a film she was great like The Hours. Has anyone, anyone turned on The Hours again? Like, I mean, it's, a, it's the same thing as The Artist or like, you know, you know, films that uh, there's so many movies that have won, like Shakespeare in Love or Saving Private Ryan. Like there's so many films that win and you go and they're just completely forgotten, about, not forgotten about Saving Private I mean, Shakespeare in Love. I can all about, but, but guarantee you that I haven't seen oh, 30 of seconds of The Hours but I mean, no one so talks you you about it. You would have called it the minutes, is what you're trying to say. I would have called it the seconds. <laughs> Unfaithful, I've seen a few times. About it. What is yeah. it about? Who directed it? But does anyone know anything about the hours? No. Am I alone on my island of not knowing a damn thing about the hours? And well, like, okay, okay, okay. You're, like, you're you're not wrong, but I got to be honest it's with you. Like, no, film. I don't it's... really hear anyone talking. Not and I, look, I I love the movie Unfaithful, but I don't hear anyone talking about Unfaithful. Yeah, either. I don't think Unfaithful. I don't it's, think it's, Unfaithful, yeah, unfaithful comes up more. It comes up more uh, in conversation. I've 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 literally had thoughts about unfaithful at least in the last year. I have not thought about the hours fine, since, yeah. since this discussion. Since but it I came think out. to Jake's point, Kevin I think I text neither about of them faithful often. We do. We have an unfaithful. I mean, but if text we're going thread. by that argument, that like <laughs> sure. Chicago. I mean, like honestly, like as much as we're ragging on Chicago, people still talk about Chicago a lot. Yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Every, every, every time. Makes, hours is Chicago. Why? Who's ragging on Chicago? It's, it's no, really no, I, just, I just feel like we're talking about like how you know the Oscars got swept up in Chicago yeah. fever and and yeah. That, you Jake, know, I will give you legitimately. I will give you fifty dollars if you can tell me who directed the hours. Oh, I can tell you right now. I have. No, I know you can, but I'm, no, I'm looking at Jake. I'm watching Jake. I'm not, in the I'm monitor. not defending the hours. I just think that that's a tricky road to go down. I don't know who directed uh, Unfaithful. I was going to say yeah, I don't yeah, think Adrian those Lynn. two movies are Adrian Lynn. Who? I think it was Adrian Lynn. Don't, don't you uh, just find it weird that, that yes, Richard Gere a, had two really strong movies and two strong performances and wasn't nominated for either of them? Well, do you think they split? Uh, maybe what was that, the second well, one? Well, he he would have been lead for Unfaithful and what supporting for supporting for Chicago. I don't know. I, I need honestly to or be honest with you, Chicago. I need to rewatch Chicago. I wonder if it holds up. It okay, so I, I rewatched it last year because Chicago came through Chicago, um, and I and I went to go see it on stage, which made me want to go rewatch the film because again, like you guys, I don't think I'd seen it since VHS. Here's here's sort of my knock against Chicago is that the and it, this is an unfair knock, but it is what it is. The, the stage production is very small and stripped down. Mm. Like there are long sequences where it's a stool on a stage, yeah. in a in a spotlight. And it feels like very like raw and kind of visceral. Like cell block and, tango, yeah, isn't cell block yeah, tango like yeah, a even, stripped even down? Yeah, even that's yeah. The whole the whole thing is really pretty stripped down. So to see that translated into this big, huge, massive movie musical number, which they didn't in fact shoot in Chicago, which again you can, it is what it is. You can't knock that, but like it just sort of felt like ah, uh, because I I loved the stripped down rawness of the stage production, and I think that turned me off a little bit to seeing it turned into this very Rob Marshall, big superfluous kind of uh, big screen production. Uh, Jake, as a mm-hmm. entertainment reporter in Chicago, a genuine question. Yeah. Is, is Chicago a Chicago movie? Like, is that one that you feel like you're bringing up because it, the audience in Chicago loves it? No. Whenever you talk about the great Chicago movies, no one mentions Chicago. Uh, the, the irony. And I think honestly, I think, I think honestly a big part of it is because they didn't shoot it here. But they but they but they worship a movie that was set in Gotham City because. okay, but just the dark night does. I'm not judging. Here's the thing. When when tourists come to the city, more people go like and you're driving in Lower Wacker. More people are going. Oh, my God. Doesn't sound like a real. That's not a real place. You made that up. That's 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 where that's where the Joker and the Batman chase take place. (laughs) Uh, More people recognize that than ever. Like, oh, look, there's Cook County Jail from Chicago. Right, you know, it's right. Cicero from Chicago. You know, no one's no one's talked about that. You know, you're, you're 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 talking about the John Hughes movies. You're talking about Blues Brothers. You're talking, you know, you're talking about the Rob the Marshall film. tour that you can go on. There's no Rob Marshall tour. <laughs> There's some multiverse <laughs> version of Jake that like every year on a clock, he's got like a Chicago segment about the musical Chicago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, did, what did I do? Like, I think no joke. I think uh, last year my boss like kind of pulled me aside and was like, hey, man, we got to like 
not every year can be a road to perdition anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> you start doing half anniversaries. <laughs> it's 22 and a half. <laughs> He's great. like, we get it. You love it. It's a Chicago movie. We get it. That's great. But like, by the way, I it's nailed. Daniel Craig's birthday. Let's do a yeah, basically. Man, that's yeah. kind of what it came down to. He was like, like, cause I think the last big thing, like when, when we got uh, Hank's, for Elvis was like around the, the 20th anniversary of Road to Perdition. And I think he like pulled me aside. I was like, okay, like that's, that's good. Let's stop there. <laughs> I want to note that, uh, that I nailed, uh, Adrian Lynn directing. Oh, you did. Uh, yes, 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 yes. I'm really glad you said directing. I did not know where that sentence was going. Yep. Nailed it. All right. What else has Adrian Lynn directed? Flashdance. Oh, uh, wow. Nine and a half weeks. Um, Ooh, Jesus. I think the update a lot of, of a lot Lolita? Of time, a lot of, but t- really? yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a really interesting. Oh, you're he's got a, the he's got a De Palma. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's funny. got a De Palma kind of sleazy, you know, sordid take on on films. You know, how and, De Palma and, doesn't mind getting getting kind of sleazy. Everyone's yeah. wrong. And the hours. So, did, did anyone want to put up a guess before I reveal? Because I feel like people at home are going to want to know. Who directed the hours? Yes. Um, I, brr, I, is it, is it someone gonna, big? It's Stephen uh, Frears. Is it Stephen Frears? You're close. Am I? Yeah. Merchant? Mm-hmm. No, no. I don't know. Stephen Daldry. Daldry? Uh, all right. Yes. Yeah, um, all right. Let's move on. Speaking of directors. No one knows couple, who that couple is big, Couple big categories left. And then if we have some, some time, we'll, we'll bounce around to a couple that you're curious about. Um, directing. This was a big one this year. Nominated. We have Talk to Her. Uh, Pedro Almodovar. Oh, Almodovar. Hmm. Uh, Stephen Daldry for The Hours. <laughs> Martin Scorsese for Gangs of New York. Rob Marshall for Chicago. Couldn't give him that best director win. And famously, <laughs> not in attendance to accept the reward, uh, Roman Polanski oh, won Polanski, that's for right. The Pianist. Wow, interesting. Yes. Received right, a so, standing uh, ovation, that yeah. Polanski. I gotta say... I, 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 I'll put the pianist in the same category as the hours in that I haven't looked at it since, you know, this sure. awards campaign. And I almost it feel feels like, like it Gangs of New York is the of the yeah, okay, let, let me ask you guys. Yeah. I, yes, I 100% agree with you in that, like, I would have gone with Scorsese. Um, but that would have been his first Oscar win. Should Gangs of New York have been the movie that Scorsese won his Oscars for? Gangs because is better than the, the Departed. Yes. You think Gangs of New York is better than Departed? Absolutely. I do. I, mean, I, I, I like The well, Departed better. I love The Departed. I mean, clearly, you know, Scorsese should have won for Taxi Driver and Raging Bull or Mean Street, whatever, uh, uh, sure, Casino, sure, sure. Goodfellas, whatever. But I would rather have had him win for Gangs than Departed. Okay, I love The Departed. It, I, I, I feel like Gangs has such a black eye in that Cameron Diaz is so bad. No, she in is. Understand that, like, yes. it just, like... I, I don't know. Like, I, there's there's but nothing in, here's in the, thing. the Departed I think, that. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? <laughs> if you say, if you say the fucking rat one more time, like the, <laughs> I mean, like the fact that the, the, the last the, the last it's three seconds of the that movie. movie cannot ruin the rest of that movie for you. Um, I think Gangs is top. I and I I was almost gonna say top three, but that's top like three blasphemous. No, but that's bl- that's that's blasphemous. If you had but to put, if you had to put five. mafia movies and if you could only pick one mafia movie, it would be top three. I guess maybe you'd say. Um, there's, uh, here's the thing. Yes, Cameron Diaz Gangs is not, is amazing. Cameron Diaz is not good in the film. No, Daniel she's Day bad. Lewis she's is, actively bad in the film. She's just miscast. She like I don't really because understand he should have cast someone who was good. Yes. Ah, oh, Jake, why were you in the room? Why were you in the, the room? <laughs> um, but Daniel Day Lewis is so good that it, he absorbs. I mean, the rest of like, don't forget John C. Riley's in that. John C. Riley's in it. Yeah. Liam Neeson's in it. Like, it's got a great ensemble. Like, Liam oh, Neeson plays tremendous. DiCaprio's dad, right? Who dies in the opening. Is Brendan oh, Gleeson in it too? It? Yeah. I feel I like think Gleason, so. if he is, he should be in it. <laughs> the opening with young DiCaprio's yeah. character and Neeson is awesome. That's an that, 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 that that opening. Butcher, the, Bill, the, Bill um, Butcher kills him, right? Yeah, the, yes. the five because the, it, it's the opening fight scene. I will mention Gangs of New York is currently on Max. If anybody wants ooh, to dial up Gangs of New York, you're making me want to watch it. I I, I got something I got to watch tonight, but you're making me want to turn it on. Yeah, 
Who cares um, about top new three? Movies, there's no way that's top three. I, I didn't say three. No, I didn't say three. I said I said I I'm almost compelled to say that I would because I love it. I I love it. I think it's terrific. I would I would almost be compelled to say it's top three. I will say it's top five. It's top five Scorsese for me. For I, I here's the thing. I would give it to Scorsese, but I I like See, I don't know. I love The Departed. I like that he won for The Departed. I don't. I can I, tell you five movies that are better than Gangs right now, and I love Gangs. I mean, Goodfellas, The Aviator. Hugo, no. not um, Raging Bull, yeah. Taxi Driver. Yeah, I think you're dude. The Aviator is probably his most underrated movie. It's a but brilliant. I, I think his top three film. are are Taxi Driver, Raging Bull, and Raging Goodfellas. Bull, Goodfellas. Right. Those are the three. I mean, we're you guys, well, you guys all sleep on we, Hugo. I know Jake doesn't, but you guys I love Hugo. I'm going to framed. Hugo I, I, said, I said I said yeah. I know Jake doesn't. But can, can, we just, can, we just, can we just address like. It's fine. I, I love Casino. I love Casino. Great. Yeah. Casino's but, amazing. But, but yeah. Casino has one of, and he, and look, Thelma Schumacher is one of the greatest editors who has ever edited in the history of cinema. Great. Potentially cool. running for but the best. That, but that, take. that edit in Casino where De Niro gets in the opening scene where De Niro gets into the car and there's an edit where all of a sudden you can see a dummy lying in the car before it explodes. <laughs> I really would well, just love to, I don't know if he, if Scorsese not, would. Schumacher's got the footage that she's got. You know, I, 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 re- I really, I know, yeah. but like, I then, then cut to like the car. I, I, don't, I don't know. I Dude, was that happened, that happened in Wolf of Wall Street. I actually approached Scorsese at, a, at an award show. To ask him about that, to ask him about the dummy? Not, not the dummy. It was, there was a similar weird edit there's a scene in Wolf of Wall Street. I'm trying to remember the scene. It's DiCaprio getting out of the car to walk in the building to meet Spike Jones to, okay. to start working for him. And there's a there's a really, really, really weird edit in that scene. And I remember being like taken back by it. And I remember approaching him at the at a table and asking him. And he was like he was he was actually happy that I had brought it up. And he I'm trying to remember his explanation. He he told me literally why that edit was made. And to your point about um about uh, uh, Casino, that would have been another if, if interesting follow-up. If we get follow him up. on the show, yeah, do, do, he, he, dude, do we he ask knows. Him about the, it? Well, I, I think I think one hundred percent. Like, dude, when I brought that up to him about Wolf of Wall Street, which is kind of technically, I would argue, a, 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 a mistake continuity yeah. type of edit. Um, I brought it up in a, in a loving way. I was like, I love the film, but I, mean, I was wondering what your choice was in this shot or this edit. Uh, he was very cool about going. I'm so glad you noticed that. Let me tell yeah. you why I did it. Whatever. That could be an interesting um, discussion. Just because, like the you know, yeah. like the the dummy is in like a completely different sitting position than De Niro was <laughs> whenever he got in the car. I don't know. If, if, this is like this. I know this isn't our call to action, but like in the comments, let me know. Am I crazy? Does that bother anybody else? That, like, that's a different question. Well, that's a different question. Just, yeah. Someone brought I've up never today, noticed that until you said it. The like sometimes you're just and Gabe just said it. Sometimes you you deal with the footage that you're left with. Like, yeah. They, yeah. They showed the. Um, Talia Agul, Talia Agul's death. Oh, in when she goes, Dark Knight Rises, <laughs> and they go. There's no way that Nolan yeah. said this is the best take that I have. Of this. All right, this is usually a quick one because the time we get here, we've talked about a lot of the movies that are in this category. But we'll finish with the big one, which is Best Picture uh, for the 2003 Academy Awards Celebrating Films released in 2002. Nominated, we have The Pianist. The Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, mm. The Hours, Gangs <laughs> of New York, pick. Gangs of New York, and winning is Chicago. Gangs. <clears throat> yeah, gangs. Okay. I'm giving it to gangs. Uh, a, a little, little uh, for, for our YouTube audience. This is back when they only had five. They could only have five. They, they only have yeah, five. They only had five. Yeah. I guess. I showed this before, but for people who haven't watched our show before, this Kill Bill trailer was on Gangs of New York. Mm. Um, I remember going to see Gangs of New York. This was the Kill Bill trailer that aired that had just it was just one movie. And it ended with that line of tricks are for kids. And so the, this, the movie hadn't been split yet. It was still coming out as Kill Bill. And I remember seeing the trailer. I was a, obviously a huge Tarantino fan. And I remember going up to the booth like the, the next day or whatever and going to the projectionist and saying, can I have that trailer? And he and gave it to you? I'm not, dude, I, I've, I've had this, I handed this to Tarantino for Hateful Eight and he was so flipped out. He goes, I cut that trailer myself yeah. and this, and it's cool because like it says, like it can't be shown 
if you're on YouTube, um, it says you I'm can't. I'm away that the guy gave it to you. <laughs> well, I, I mean, he was just a kid, you know. He yeah, probably yeah, yeah. And you yeah. aren't supposed to. You aren't supposed to give these away. But he's I, in jail I, now, I, though. We should. Yeah. Say. <laughs> yeah, no, but I'll, but I'll always treasure this because this was the print. So before gangs in New York, this was what was shown. This exact trailer. Um, I remember exactly where I saw it. That gangs in New York, and then again, I'm not saying this is the reason why gangs in New York should win Best Picture. It's just a memory I have of that of that sure. film, and it was. It's a really powerful movie, and the the music. Remember the music. That 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 film that music in that film was so it's interesting. That, also, like, <clears throat> this is a weird little bit of trivia. They shout my name out in the middle of Gangs of New York. Do they? Sean O'Connell. They, they do. Yeah, they're oh. recruiting. Um, I don't know why I said why I asked that. Like like that's what they shouted. <laughs> that's your name. <laughs> no, Alex. Uh, no, no, Rodriguez. no, they, no they, they, they shouted Sean underscore yeah, O'Connell. Yeah, right. right. yeah. right. yeah. <laughs> Scorsese. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm going to go with. Now I'm going with Two Towers. No, you're not. I, I, but see, I, mean, but, I, I but, love But Lord Return of the Rings. is the best movie. Return's the best one. Uh, one, I think Fellowship is the best. Um, but I also, but I think of the entirety of Lord of the Rings, Two Towers has the best sequence, which is the uh, Two Helm's Towers Deep, is uh, amazing sequence. And but uh, a couple of films that weren't nominated again, Road to Perdition should have been nominated. Um, but there's also a film that came out in 2002 that I'm sure you guys love that came out that is a stone cold masterpiece. If you have not seen it, which you call City of God. If you haven't oh, seen City of God, yeah. City of God is, I mean, should have been nominated for director, should have been nominated for picture. Um, was the well, sequel in it? They did a sequel to that, didn't they? Wasn't there they? a sequel? I thought it was called City. I thought the director did a follow up. City oh, of God. So. Gave, did sequel. City of God win the international, the best foreign language? Uh, that year? That's what I don't think it won. How did I do think that, uh, that's considered by many people to be like. One uh, of not the best it, films released this century. It's one of my oh. favorite movies of all yeah. time. It's one of those movies that you watch for the first time and it changes your life. Yeah, like City of God. You, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's, that's uh, um, okay. So I was wrong. They, I guess they were developing a a uh, a sequel show at HBO Max back in 2022. City of God is that should have been nominated and so, maybe have won. So here's the thing <laughs> about City of God. I think this is um, a weird thing with its international release. It looks like it was a part of the 2004 Oscars. Oh, so interesting. It, so he was um, nominated for director. Oh, um, okay. Well, now it I was, feel stupid. No, no, you're okay. Because it was it was released in 2002, I think, officially. But it looks like it, it was, I assume, some sort of... Um, Can I? Some sort of international release thing. But anyway, real quick. Adapted screenplay, best cinematography, and editing. It was all nominated for. Uh, it screened at Cannes in 2002. And okay. then was released in Brazil, but it hit the United States in January of 2003. So I take that back. That's my, my mistake. No, you're good. All you're right. Good. See, it's, it's no, no, but Jake, it is a 2002 film. I mean, Technically, it's yeah, just, in a way. Yeah, it, it's it's just like, because if you type in 2002 movies, that 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 is listed. It's actually right next to, on Google, it's right next to The Rookie <laughs> and We Were Soldiers. That's why I brought that up. Nice. Um, so um, that's a good, that was a good year. Oh, guys, guys, you're <clears> sleeping on the, the ultimate one. Spider Man the Scorp- Two, the, the Scorpion King, baby, come on! Spider Man <laughs> Two, underrated. Spider Man Two, Spider-Man Spider-Man. Two. <laughs> Jesus! Yeah. Scorpion yeah. King's underrated, I'll say. Not because it's great, but because people <laughs> think it's so terrible that it's actually not that it's, terrible. It's the Nickelback effect. <laughs> I'm telling you, <laughs> it applies to everything. It applies to everything. Nickelback, right. yeah, suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's the Nickelback effect. Anyway, that is for for people who are being introduced to the Oscars in review. That is how that segment goes. Uh, normally, we'd bounce around different categories, but we are running along, um, so we will end it there. And I'll pass the keys over Minority to Sean report. to close well, out the episode. I'm going to just say that from uh, Academy worthy films to uh, the Expendables franchise, I want to remind <laughs> everybody that the Expendables Four is hitting theaters this week, and so head to the comments down below. And let us know who your favorite classic action star is. Obviously, a lot of people have come back for the different Expendables films. There's a terrific scene in a church that has Stallone and Bruce Willis and Arnold Schwarzenegger together for the very first time. And then over the years, that franchise has brought back everyone from Dolph Lundgren to Chuck Norris and Jet Li and Statham, obviously. So hit the comments down below. Let us know your all time favorite Classic action star. And if you want to throw in as well to your favorite movie that they were part of, please do that as well.
And I also want to mention if you're if you haven't seen Barbie yet, um, they're releasing it in IMAX this weekend, because obviously when Oppenheimer came out, it, it, would, it was it took the IMAX screens for as long as it did. Um, I kind of want to go back and see it because I'm curious how it, how it I mean, it's obviously going to be, the, it, you know, the aspect ratio is going to be the same, but I'm curious how it plays in IMAX. So if you haven't seen it yet and you haven't gone out, you know, that might be a good chance for you to check it out um, in there IMAX. Um, the the um, creator gets IMAX next week, right? Yeah, creators week. IMAX next so week. Just a yep. one week. Cool. Yeah, I think they're just doing. Like, but I also think uh, I think I think they're like I think Greta's putting in like some additional footage or something. I think mm. there's like a I think I think in the in the I think in that's the correct, yeah. credits and more sand. You know, I'm, as Sean yeah, puts it. yeah. <laughs> uh, more, more pink, more pink. Uh, I'll I'll, uh, I'll shamelessly plug our Greta interview. Uh, obviously, if you haven't heard it, check out our Greta. Uh, she's interview. wonderful. Please, I'll, she's put, great. That, I'll yep. put that in the thing. In the meantime, cool. join us back here next week uh, for more interviews, more film talk, uh, and just more of us, basically. So follow us online uh, on social media at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach, and the show is at Real Blend. Until next week, pay your artists. Pay your pay artists. artists. By the way, the strike is probably going to get resolved uh, right after we record this, because that's just how <laughs> things work. Maybe. So. Pay your artist and the man who hey, moved that, the earth. That's good news. We'll just take good news. Yeah. We'll take By the news. way, Oppenheimer at $913 million worldwide, and still going. C- commit that's to the pit. Good.